Hello, I am Marshall Masters, and in this Yowza.com Planet X System update number one, we're going to present an overview of the Planet X system, how it moves through our solar system, and why we always seem to observe it near the sun and not behind us. Then we will view images from recent observations of three planets in the Planet X system captured with National Data Buoy Center buoys located in the Gulf of Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. The first tribulation and the beginning of the timeline is the winter of ash, and it is principally caused by a galactic superwave, as discussed in our previous video, Yowza.com Volcano Update Number 1. So in this program, we will examine the first three Planet X events projected for this tribulation timeline by the guides in the book Being in it for the Species. They are Covert Visitations, Deep Impact, and the Perihelion Alignment of the Planet X System as it will be seen from Earth. I will then conclude this video with a postscript in which I share my final thoughts about the vital information presented in this program. So with that, let us begin with an overview of the Planet X system. In the book, Being in it for the Species, the guides give us very specific descriptions of the various bodies in the Planet X system. In this program, we will examine them one by one, and then we'll see how the Planet X system moves through our own solar system. This will be important because a common question we hear is, why is it we do not see the Planet X system behind us each year as well as in front of us? To answer this question, we first need to look at the bodies which comprise the Planet X system. At the core of the Planet X system is the nemesis Brown Dwarf Star. It is 56 times the size of Earth and has the mass of 171,000 Earths. The largest planet in the Planet X system is Nibiru, as it is known by the inhabitants of this system. It is six times the size of Earth, and its mass is also six times that of Earth. It has a moon we named Ferrada, in memory of astronomer Carlos Muñoz Ferrada. In size and mass, Ferrada is comparable to our own moon. The second largest planet in the Planet X system is Helion, as it is known by the inhabitants of the system. It is three and a half times the size of Earth, but as a bright gaseous planet, its mass is only two and a half times that of the Earth. It also has a moon we named Harrington, in memory of the U.S. naval astronomer Robert Sutton Harrington. In size and mass, Harrington is comparable to our own moon. The smallest of the three planets is Arboda, as it is known by the inhabitants of the system. It is two and a half times the size of Earth, and likewise its mass is also two and a half times that of Earth. Arboda is in a very fast orbit around Nemesis, relative to Nibiru and Helion, and has no moon. Now that we have identified the major bodies in this system, let's take a polar, look-down view of all these objects together, beginning with the smaller sister sun to our own sun, the Nemesis Dark Star. Nemesis is what is known as a brown dwarf star which means it is small and very dirty and cannot be seen in the visible light spectrum until it is well inside our own system. However, its approach has been viewed in the infrared range by our governments for decades. The nearest planet to Nemesis is Helion, a bright gaseous planet, and here is its moon, Harrington. Next out is Arboda the lonely fast mover in the system. And in the outermost orbit around Nemesis is Nibiru, which according to the ancient Sumerians means the planet of crossing. And finally, furthest out from the Nemesis dark star is Nibiru's moon, Farada. 
To get an idea of how large the Planet X system is in relationship to our own system, let's overlay one upon the other. To do that, we begin with our own Sun. Next comes Mercury, then Venus, our own lovely third rock from the Sun, Earth, then the mysterious red planet, Mars, and finally Jupiter. Because the Planet X system is so relatively small when compared to our own, these planets will suffice for now. So, let's place the Planet X system into our own to get an idea of just how small it really is. When you consider that we left Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto out of the picture, the Planet X system really does look puny in comparison. Nonetheless, the question we hear more often than not is why are all of our observations of the Planet X system near the Sun? For many, the assumption is that we should see the Planet X system in front of us as well as behind us once each year. So let's take a closer look at this assumption, which is based more on expectations than fact. In most people's minds, planets move around the sun much like trains on a railroad track. You know where they're going, just like freight trains traveling on fixed rails. However, the Planet X system moves through space more like an airplane, and unless you're a flyer or you've taken a few flying lessons, this can be difficult to grasp at first. This is because, as every flying student learns, airplanes have a longitudinal, lateral, and vertical axis. Hence the term flying by the seat of your pants, because an important part of becoming a pilot is the ability to feel the orientation of your aircraft with your tuchus. Lucky for us, there is a celestial comparison between trains and airplanes when we look at comets. To set a background for this comparison, let's use this illustration of our solar system as seen from deep space. That outer ball, which has a cutaway section in this illustration, is known as the Oort cloud and it is made up of all the debris left over from the formation of our solar system. Occasionally, a comet flies in from deep space and passes through our solar system. Called rogue comets, these comets are fast movers, and if they keep their distance, they can avoid being captured by the gravity of our own sun, at which point they fly right out the other side of our solar system back into the pitch black darkness of deep space, never to be seen again. Ergo, these rogue comets are what you might call the celestial freight trains. They've got a single-minded focus as to where they're going, and they just plow straight through. However, the Planet X system does not orbit our sun like a predictable freight train. Rather, it orbits our sun much like an airplane, on three axes longitudinal, lateral, and vertical. Consequently, its movements are far more complex. In fact, in being in it for the species, the guides tell us that it moves through the skies like nothing we've ever seen before. To help us put that in context, we need to see how the Planet X system orbits our own sun relative to our own view of the sun and the Planet X system. To do that, we must begin at the ecliptic. This blue line stretching across the screen represents the ecliptic, which in a manner of speaking could be referred to as the sun's equator, or more accurately, as the plane of our solar system. Imagine this blue line representing the ecliptic begins at a point in the very center of the sun and then stretches out in a concentric ring to the 12 constellations of the zodiac. Using the observation reports we've published in previous Yowza.com videos, let's now plot the movement of Nemesis, the brown dwarf at the core of the Planet X system, relative to our own Sun and the ecliptic as seen from Earth. Here's where our estimate of Nemesis was in 2010, based on the observations of Nibiru from 2010 to 2013. And here we see where Nemesis was observed in May of 2013. 
we use these two reference points to create a rudimentary orbital path based on the fact that Nemesis is in a 3600 year long elliptical orbit around our Sun. And here we see estimates of where Nemesis will be at the end of this year on the opposite side of the Sun. This explains why we cannot see it at this time. However, Nemesis will come out from behind the Sun as it reaches its point of perihelion. That point in its orbit where it comes closest to our own Sun. So with this background in mind, we're ready to take on the question. Why are we not seeing the Planet X system in front of us and behind us each year? With that, let's return to our deep space view of our solar system. Like an airplane that flies on three axes, the Planet X system essentially does the same. While it is bobbing up and down, so to speak, it is also orbiting around the Sun as well, no differently than any of the other planets in our system. Again, remember that the guides have told us that the Planet X system moves through our skies like nothing else we've ever seen before. The bobbing up and down motion is straightforward, but in terms of moving sideways in orbit around the Sun, we need to look at the number of days it takes for the Planet X system to orbit our Sun as it bobs up and down through our solar system. Let's begin with Earth which we know takes 365 days to orbit the Sun. What the guides tell us is that even though the Planet X system is bobbing up and down, it also takes 380 days for this system to orbit around our Sun as well. Now we're ready to put it all together. To the left, we see a polar look-down view of Earth, Nemesis, and the Sun. To the right, we see a side view of our solar system from the ecliptic, with Earth on one side of the Sun and Nemesis on the other, which is why we cannot observe it at this time. Keeping that in mind, let's now change our point of view. To the left, we still have the look-down polar view. But to the right, we now have a frontal view as seen from Earth. Here we see Earth and Nemesis as they track around the Sun in 2010. In 2013, Earth is seen catching up because it has a shorter duration orbit around the Sun. And so, Nemesis appears closer to the Sun. Here we see an approximation of where we presently are with Nemesis being directly behind the Sun in 2014. And here we see Nemesis coming out from behind the Sun several months from now. And finally, here's where Earth will be relative to the Sun and Nemesis when Nemesis reaches its point of perihelion. To see the full range of motion, let's view a composite of all these points in space. Because Earth orbits the Sun every 365 days and Nemesis orbits the Sun every 380 days, Earth has slowly been gaining on Nemesis. And this is why the recent observations of Nemesis over the past few years have always placed it near the Sun from our point of view here on Earth. Nemesis is presently behind the Sun and unobservable at this time. But interestingly enough, we have current observations of its three planets, Helion, Arboda, and Nibiru. And we're going to show them to you in the next part of our program. Planet X Observations In this segment, you're going to see observation images of three planets in the Planet X system captured with National Data Buoy Center buoys located in the Gulf of Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. However, before we show you these observations, we need to address two issues to help put these observations into proper context. First, a common complaint we receive from people who live in large metropolitan areas, that they are unable to observe objects in the Planet X system for themselves. There are two principal reasons for this. They do not look in the right direction at the right time, but more often even if they do, Chemtrail aerosols make it impossible for them to see objects in the Planet X system. The other issue is the planet of Venus. 
Because these observations are near the Sun, a simplistic debunking tactic is to say we are looking at Venus. For this reason, before we show you the buoy images, we need to briefly discuss the phases of Venus so that you understand why this kind of simplistic debunking is false. Despite massive propaganda efforts by our government, a growing majority of Americans understand that chemtrail spraying is a real part of our lives. There are several reasons for it, and while some would think that the primary purpose is to make it more difficult to observe objects in the Planet X system, the two main reasons for chemtrail spraying are weather modification and crowd control. The atmosphere of our planet is drier with less overall moisture, which is why there are droughts and floods. Chemtrail spraying is being used to divert moisture from some areas to others for various reasons. This is the simple reason why we're seeing the extreme drought conditions in the western side of our country now. Moisture is being diverted eastward where it is needed for agriculture, mining, and manufacturing. These industries require great amounts of water and chemtrail spraying is the functional answer to that need. If there was one thing the American government learned during the Vietnam War, was that an outraged citizenry can overpower the political aims of a few. It is why our leaders now add chemicals to the chemtrail mix to ensure our passivity and indifference. If the Americans of the 60s could see what is happening today, things would be vastly different. However, after a decade of being sprayed by chemicals that induce apathy, Along with GMO foods and drugs like Prozac, people are dulled. Consequently, we're not alarmed by these weather modification efforts, which are substantial. However, more to the point here is that chemtrail aerosols are blocking the sky. And this is not a conspiracy theory. Not when you have mainstream media outlets like the New York Times publishing an op-ed titled Blocking the Sky to Save the Earth or Scientific American warning us that geoengineering could turn skies white, which in fact it has. To illustrate this fact, we'll use a simple simulation to show how chemtrail aerosols have impacted our ability to view the sky. Here we have a nice afternoon sky without aerosols, but after the spraying the skies aloft become heavily masked. Here we have a twilight sky without aerosols, but now as you can see, the chemtrail aerosols are falling to the ground as the air cools towards evening. Here we have a clear evening sky such as what we would have seen before the advent of chemtrails. But now our evening skies are not as clear because the aerosols have finally reached the ground. Here we have a clear pre-dawn sky such as what we would have seen in the days before chemtrails. However, these days, much of the aerosols sprayed the day before have either settled to the ground or have mostly dispersed, and asking where that has gone to is a thorny question. Here we see the sun in the early morning, as seen from the buoys that captured the images we'll show you later on in this program. Keep this image in mind because this is the kind of clear sky that is being seen from these offshore buoys. On the other hand, this is more typical of the morning sky most Americans see today. So yes, chemtrails are blocking our view of the sky. This explains why we are able to show you excellent images of Planet X objects in pictures taken from offshore buoys. Given their locations at sea, they are mostly outside normal chemtrail spraying patterns. Also, these images were captured early in the morning, after the residual chemtrail aerosols in the area have either dissipated or have been blown away by prevailing winds. Chemtrails or not, you can still count on debunkers to say it's Venus. So, let's take a quick look at the phases of Venus.
The seven image panels of objects in the Planet X system we'll present in this program were chosen for a specific reason. The phases of Venus, which you can learn about on Wikipedia. This is because one of the simplistic debunkings we often encounter because we're observing objects close to the Sun is that they are dismissed out of hand as being the planet Venus. So rather than taking our word for it, we want you to understand the phases of Venus so you can judge this for yourself as you review these images with us. In all seven of the image panels we're going to show you, Venus is to the far right of the Sun in relationship to the ecliptic, that green line you see dotted through the screen. However, the key point here is that according to Wikipedia, Venus only presents a full image when it is on the opposite side of the Sun. Therefore, as we present buoy images from September 29, 2014 to October 12, 2014, we will show you images where Venus is to the right of the Sun in relationship to the ecliptic, along with a close-up of each observed object, so you can determine for yourself whether that object has a full or partial face. With that, we begin in the Bay of Alaska. The first two images we will present are from station 46061 in the Bay of Alaska between the Montague and Hitchinbrook Islands. Our first observation is for September 29, 2014, and in the panel at the top of the screen we see five images. These panel images are usually taken about an hour apart, and the timestamp usually refers to the last image in the panel with the time being noted in UTC. Here, our image of interest is second from the right. This object appears to the left of the Sun from the horizon, where Venus is much further over to the right of the Sun. However, when you look at this object in the lower left-hand panel, it clearly shows a full face. Next is an image captured on September 30th, 2014, and it is in the center of the panel. Here, Venus is a good distance from the Sun, although both objects are to the right of the Sun from the horizon. Yet once again, we clearly see an object with a full face. Next, we're going to show you a series of five images, captured from the National Data Buoy Center Station 42040, located 64 nautical miles south of Dolphin Island, Alabama, in the Gulf of Mexico. Our first image from this buoy is on October 4, 2014, and it is the first image to the left. Here we see Venus is closer to the Sun, yet the object captured in this panel displays a full face. Next is October 5, 2014, the following day. Here we see a well-defined full face on the object. Our next Gulf of Mexico observation is on October 6, 2014, and once again we see an object with a full face. Our sixth image panel was acquired on October 8, 2014, and while a passing cloud interferes with the image, the distance between Venus and the Sun is considerable. Our last panel was taken on October 12, 2014, and even though this object is very close to the Sun, it still exhibits a very clear and distinguished full face. After completing our examination of the seven panels, we decided to ask the guides about these images with the help of Adriana, the professional psychic who performed our technical readings, which are presented in the first section of Being in it for the Species. What we learned from the guides surprised us. According to the guides, these seven panels contain images of our Boda, Helion, and Nibiru. So now we will show you which of the panels revealed which objects, beginning with the planet Arboda. According to the guides, Arboda was first observed from the Gulf of Alaska on September 30, 2014. The second time it was observed was from the Gulf of Mexico on October 12, 2014. As you can see, these two observations are of an object above the Sun at the 1 o'clock and 11 o'clock positions. We asked the guides for an explanation, and what they told us is that there was a span of nearly two weeks between these observations, 
And since our Boda has the shortest orbital duration of the three Planet X system planets, this was just normal for its orbit. Next was Helion, which according to the guides was first observed in the Gulf of Alaska on September 29, 2014, and then once again from the Gulf of Mexico on October 5, 2014. We found these observations of our Boda and Helion to be most impressive because they were captured from different buoys thousands of miles apart. However, what comes next puts a whole new spin on the word interesting. According to the guides, the planet Nibiru was first observed from the Gulf of Mexico on October 4, 2014, then again by the same buoy on October 6, 2014, and yet once again from the same buoy on October 8. Now that you've seen these images, you might be doing what many Americans do when they look at a picture of a UFO. They just say, I can't believe my eyes. If so, keep the following in mind. When the time comes that everyone can see these objects with their own eyes, regardless of the chemtrail aerosols, the fear that will clutch at the throats of many will not be because of what they see in the sky. Rather, it will be the realization that they are not prepared for what they see in the sky. And being prepared is really what it's all about when you consider what happens during the first three Planet X events. According to the guides, the principal causality of the first event on the Tribulation timeline, the Winter of Ash, is a galactic superwave. This phenomenon is well described by physicist Dr. Paul LaViolat in his book Earth Under Fire, and it is fully explained in our previous video, Yauza.com Volcano Update Number 1. Therefore, in this program, we'll move ahead on the Tribulation timeline to the first three events related solely to the flyby of the Planet X system through the core of our own system, beginning with the covert visitations which happen after the Winter of Ash. Following that will be the Deep Impact event, which we will explain in depth in this segment with specific regards to the impactor origins, the impact itself, and the consequences of all that. Following this, we will show you the perihelion alignment of the Planet X system and explain why this particular alignment is so crucial. If there's one thing the topic of Planet X has in common with ufology, is that regardless of how many mountains of photographic evidence you produce, most people will still say, I just can't believe it. Regrettably, this very expression of cognitive dissonance plays directly into the hands of the Anunnaki, the inhabitants of Nibiru, and the elite leadership of our own planet. Following the Winter of Ash event, which causes global economic and political chaos, the Anunnaki will begin making covert visits to our world leaders. In being in it for the species, the guides tell us the Anunnaki will advise our leaders about this impending asteroid impact event. How will it play out? The guides tell us those who are fated to be in the crosshairs of this disaster will be the last to know. According to the guides, this impactor will be an asteroid in our own system, and it is currently located somewhere between the orbits of Mercury and Venus. While it presents absolutely no threat to Earth at this time, the approach of the Planet X system will bump it into a trajectory that will bring it into contact with the Earth. To help visualize this, let's begin with a simple side view of our system. As you can see here, we have Earth and the ecliptic, the plane of our galaxy we discussed earlier. This asteroid will travel near to the ecliptic, and for those who've been kept in the dark about its approach, there will be no way to know it is coming. However, the guides tell us that when we see Nemesis coming out from behind the sun with the planet Helion to its right and Nibiru below the ecliptic and near to the sun, that dying time is near. To get the picture of what that means for us, we'll use this world map to plot this impact event and its consequences. The asteroid will travel from west to east as it approaches the eastern Atlantic and the impact site will be off the coast of France. 
This impact will occur in an area of deep seabed and drive forward a massive tsunami into Europe. A wall of water so large even London and Paris will flood. Plus, there will be a rearward tsunami that will travel in the opposite direction across the Atlantic towards North America as the ejecta and ash fall from the impact begins to fall on Europe. Traveling as fast as a modern jet airliner, the rearward tsunami wave will strike into the northeastern seaboard of North America with devastating consequences for America and Canada. But that is not even the half of it. Shortly after the impact in the eastern Atlantic, the active volcano on Las Palmas will erupt, causing its western flank to fail. This will generate the Las Palmas tsunami many have feared for years, and it will follow quickly on the heels of the asteroid's rearward impact tsunami. This second tsunami wave will strike a much greater swath on the east coast of America and Canada, and will be significantly more powerful. Plus, it will combine with the effects of the first tsunami wave for a two-fisted knockout blow that will spell the end of America as the current dominant world power. It will also deal a devastating blow to Atlantic alliances which are dependent on a very sophisticated transatlantic communication infrastructure of deep undersea fiber optic cables. As you can see here, the impact site relative to this communication infrastructure gives one pause to wonder about where this asteroid strikes. Is it happenstance? Or are we looking at the possibility of a targeted projectile? Not only in terms of the communications aspect, but also for what happens next. The impact will be on the western side of the Eurasian plate, and the force of the impact will travel through the Earth's interior to the eastern side of that same plate. Here you see an equatorial view of that line of travel for added perspective. Once this energy wave strikes the opposite side of the Eurasian plate, the consequence will be a massive disruption of the Pacific seabed, starting in the Kamchatka area, moving south towards Antarctica. There it will rebound and head back north, triggering undersea volcanoes and earthquakes as it goes. As you can obviously see here, the Hawaiian Islands are in the crosshairs of this rebound wave. But this wave, which rebounds off Antarctica, will also cause great earthquakes and volcanic eruptions for those nations in South, Central, and North America bordering the Ring of Fire. After the dust settles, both the eastern and western shores of the United States will be devastated, and then the unthinkable will happen. In what will seem like a blink of the eye, America will become a third world nation. However, the guides also tell us that no nation on earth, no matter how wealthy or advanced, will be able to escape the cataclysms to come. And with that, now comes the really bad news. In Being in it for the Species, the guides tell us that when we see this alignment of the Planet X system, Nemesis will have reached its point of perihelion which is its closest distance to the sun. After that, it turns south into the outbound leg of its orbit. From this time forward, events far worse than the deep impact event will unfold, to include a pole shift. Simply put, these events will brutalize us and our world. So the question now is, what do we do about it? Because when we do see Nemesis at perihelion, there will only be two kinds of people in the world, those who are prepared and those who are not. In my postscript, which follows next, I'm going to address that very point and what I intend to do about it. I began researching Planet X in 2001 and published my first article on the topic of Planet X in January 2002. Over the years, I and my fellow researchers have always treated the topic as a threshold risk issue. However, with the release of Being in it for the Species and this video, that has changed. We at Yowza.com now view Planet X as a clear and present danger. Therefore, the conversation about it has changed from 
will it come in our lifetime to how will we survive it? Keep in mind, many of us will, so the consequences are much larger than mere survival itself. Humanity will survive this flyby as it has others in the past. Then we will rebuild and go to the stars. Therefore, the transcendent issue is not survival. It is how we go to the stars after the tribulation. And here, humanity has a clear choice. We can go as Anunnaki stormtroopers, despised by other races. Or we can evolve as a result of this tragedy to become an enlightened spacefaring race, welcomed throughout the galaxy. In essence, what I am saying is that I do believe humanity is worthy of a Star Trek future. For this reason, my mission has changed. I will now devote myself to survival wellness advocacy and join with like minded others in the peaceful pursuit of a noble destiny where the meek truly do inherit the earth. If you feel the same noble calling to be in it for the species, then you are my brother. You are my sister. Let us move forward together. To learn more about the tribulation projections made by the guides in Being In It For The Species, visit beinginitforthespecies.com or yowza.com.